2019, the impossible happened. The Liverpool football team overturned a 3-0 first leg defeat, beating Barcelona 4-0 in the second leg of the Champions League semi-final. Now, Barcelona were reputed to be the best team in the world at the time, and recovering from the first leg defeat seemed impossible, especially as Liverpool were playing without their star striker, Mo Salah, due to injury. Liverpool's manager, Jurgen Klopp, reported later that he had told his players before the game, the world outside is saying it's not possible. And let's be honest, it's probably impossible. But because it's you, because it's you, we have a chance. The impossible happened. Jurgen Klopp demonstrated extraordinary faith in the character, the tenacity, the resilience of his players. He added, it wasn't about their technical ability as footballers. It was about who they were as human beings and everything they had overcome in life. And as he watched the match from the sidelines, Mo Salah revealed the t-shirt he was wearing with the message, never give up. As great nights of football go, it was up there amongst the very best. Jurgen Klopp's faith in his players and Mo Salah's message of determination provide me with the title of my sermon today, never give up. But that was last season. What about now? What about this peculiar season we're in? Who could have imagined a year ago, or even at the start of this year, that we'd be living through such extraordinary times? Last week, Caroline reminded us of the importance of lament, giving expression before God to all the fears, hurts, worries and losses that we experience, being honest about the reality we're in. We know that amongst us we've experienced all kinds of losses, perhaps the death of friends or family to COVID-19, perhaps the loss of income or economic security. All of us have experienced the loss of freedom to some degree or another, and many have experienced the loss of significant events, leaving schools, starting schools, weddings, baptisms, birthday celebrations, exams. How have you felt through all this? I don't know about you, but I've experienced a peculiar mix of emotions, exhilarated by the challenge of being responsive to the crisis on some days, but totally exhausted on others. Wildly fluctuating emotions one day, but completely numb the next. Sometimes hopeful about the possibility of change, growth and development in both our personal and corporate lives, but at other times full of despair over how much progress has been undone. And my spiritual life? Well, that's been tough. I've been confronted again by how much I depend on worshipping together with you all for the flourishing of my own faith. Strip away the songs of worship that we sing together and I can quickly feel as though God were distant and remote. My old habits of Bible reading and prayer have sustained me, but I've found that my concentration span is dramatically reduced, so that sustained Bible reading, study and prayer has been difficult. I've been really grateful for the discipline of morning prayer to keep me meeting with others and plodding on in faith. And if you relate to any of that, well, blessed are the plodders. So how do we respond to God's instruction to us in the Bible reading today? with its exhortation to never be lacking in zeal and to keep your spiritual fervour seems impossible. The passage continues to invite us to never give up, with its instruction to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Well, how do we do this when we're barely keeping our head above water, when we're plodding on faithfully but without much spring in our step? The answer that I have found to be effective for me is this, that I focus not so much on my commitment to never give up on God, but rather I keep my attention on God's commitment to never give up on me. When I remember that God never gives up on me, then I find it easier to keep going in my faith. Hopefulness floods back in and my plodding becomes a more powerful stride. So I want to share with you how I remember that God never gives up on us. Driving back from France last week, we drove through sunshine and showers and with them came some extraordinary rainbows. Double rainbows, rainbows where we could see both ends, rainbows with the most vibrant and luminous colours. 
Now rainbows are all around us nowadays in pedestrian crossings, clothes, flags, shop signage. They are used in our wider society to celebrate unity and in diversity and to remind us to care for, value and love people different from ourselves and that is certainly good. But for a Christian, a rainbow tells of much more than pride in our own human diversity. It tells of God's pride and delight in his creation, human, animal and the whole created realm. The rainbow is a reminder of God's promises not to destroy, but rather to sustain the earth and all of his creation. It reminds us of his commission to us, his image-bearing human creation, to be good stewards of creation, to exercise creation care along with him. The rainbow reminds us that God is not done with us yet. Later on in the Old Testament, beyond the story of the rainbow in Genesis, we have Moses' final words to the Israelites in Deuteronomy. Having journeyed through a wilderness, having experienced the highs and lows of leading God's people on a long and troublesome journey, Moses charges the Israelites with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of the trials and enemies you face. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He continues, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus himself confirms the promises in his words to his disciples in Matthew 28, 20. He says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God will never give up on you. His love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on us. Jesus has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. Well, how does this work? How is God with us? I want to suggest briefly three ways in which God is with us as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Firstly, Father. I've been watching an amazing series on Netflix this week. It's called Cobra Kai. It's a fan flick series continuing the story of Daniel LaRusso, the Karate Kid, and his arch enemy, Johnny Lawrence. The original Karate Kid movie is set in 1984, and it ends with the teenage protagonists in a David versus Goliath style karate tournament showdown. And the series picks up the story 34 years later, with both men now middle-aged, and struggling with their frustrations and failings as fathers to their own teenage children. The series, in many ways, is a classic exploration of fatherhood and the importance of adoptive fathers who make up for the deficiencies of absent or unkind fathers. Now, our experience of our earthly fathers will vary enormously. Some of us will have been abandoned by our fathers, others poorly loved or mistreated. Some of us will have known something of God's steadfast love and faithfulness through the constant care and affection of their earthly father. Some will be estranged from their earthly fathers by death, recent or long past, or by broken relationships. And yet we have a vision of what a good father could and should be. The standard by which we measure our earthly fathers is the character and nature of God, our Father in heaven. Sometimes, of course, we get it muddled and we measure God according to our earthly experience, believing him to be cruel, distant, capricious or unkind due to our own earthly experience. And yet when we return to the character and nature of God as revealed to us by Jesus and through scripture, we discover a father who is always watching for us prodigals to return who feasts and celebrates when we come to him, who is a friend and protector to the widow, the poor, the vulnerable, who adopts the orphan into his family. In Romans 8, St Paul sees this as central to the experience of a Christian, that we are made children of God. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, to daughtership, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
In other words, all that is true of Jesus's relationship with the Father is also true for us. We are co-heirs with Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, and looked upon with love by God our Father. The words that God speaks over Jesus in his baptism, he speaks over each one of us, every one of you. This is my son, my daughter, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The series Cobra Kai explores the ways in which earthly fathers fail, try again, keep on going. It celebrates the possibility of repaired relationships and new starts. It suggests a comparison with the perfect father in heaven who never gives up, who never leaves nor forsakes us, who is with us always. Secondly, son. God is with us as father, but also he is with us in the person of Jesus. God says in Colossians 1, 27, that God is revealed in the world by Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. If you belong to God, if you are part of his family, then Christ is in you, the hope of glory. It's an amazing claim. The eternal Son of God, second person of the Holy Trinity, the incarnate, resurrected and ascended Jesus is somehow in us. How on earth does this work? Well, our human language will never fully comprehend this holy mystery. But we know that the Spirit of God is involved and we have some images to help us. And one of the images is of blood. And it reminds us of the blood ties of family and the shared DNA they carry, but also of the lifeblood that flows within us. In the ancient world, blood was deemed to carry life itself, and for good reason. People observed that if a person or an animal was cut open and blood flowed from them for long enough, eventually that person or animal died. It was as though the very life had drained out of them. Modern medicine shows us the benefit of blood transfusions for some patients. Blood given to us and for us, mingled in our bodies, bringing us health and life. Jesus shed his blood for us on the cross. Now, not only is this an atoning sacrifice, but it suggests also an offering of his life-giving blood to replace our sickly, sin-stained blood. In other words, his death on the cross is not just taking the punishment for the bad things we've done and presenting us as good before God. It's also, in a profound way, dealing with the difference between sick and healthy humanity. Our sin is like a genetic defect carried in our blood from one generation to the next, making us sick and subject to decay and ultimately death. But on the other hand, Jesus's blood is the blood of the perfect human life, life in all its fullness. And Jesus offers us a blood transfusion. His blood is mingled with ours so that his life giving presence might course through our veins and arteries, bringing life and love, health and hope to our mortal bodies. On the cross, Jesus offers us his healthy blood to replace our sick blood so that we might experience the fullness of life that is God's intention for us. Jesus is carried, as it were, in us by his blood. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is one way we might understand how Jesus is with us always. His glorious life mingled with ours and revealed in us. This is what the hope of glory means. His resurrection life and the goodness of the eternal kingdom of God being made visible in our lives and in the church for the sake of the world. So God is with us as father. God is with us uh, in the son. And finally, God promises to be with us always by his Holy Spirit. Romans 5 verse 5 says this. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God the Father reigns in heaven. Jesus is bodily resurrected and ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. In a very real sense, they are not here on earth with us. But the Holy Spirit of God, God's own living presence, person and power, is poured out at Pentecost. When in the communion liturgy we say, the Lord is here, 
It is by his spirit that God is present. And that's why we respond, his spirit is with us. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17 says, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Holy Spirit mediates God's presence to us. It is the spirit who enables us to say that Jesus is Lord. It is the spirit who stirs our hearts to worship, who guides us in prayer, who speaks to us in scripture, who fills us in communion. The whole of the Christian life is a spiritual life, not in the sense that it avoids earthly concerns and physical things, but rather that we see the presence of God the Holy Spirit active in sustaining, reconciling and renewing all things. There is no area of our lives that we may keep hidden from God's spirit. As the psalmist says in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Answer, nowhere. And the Holy Spirit is the great comforter. Acts chapter 11 says that the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up. Living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Living in the fear of the Lord, that is, in awe of God's majesty and sovereignty, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The church had peace. It was built up. It was increased in number. The Holy Spirit is God's comforting presence who brings us peace in troubled times, who builds us up and makes us grow. God is with us, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He will never leave nor forsake us. He is with us always. God never gives up on us. So what does this mean for us? Well, back to what I said earlier. I find it easier to never give up on God when I remember that he never gives up on me. And then these instructions and exhortations in Romans 12 become habits and disciplines to guide and shape the practice of my faith. They're manageable because I'm not doing them as proof to God of my commitment to him, but rather as a response to his gracious commitment to me. This little section in Romans 12 has the heading Marks of the True, true Christian in my NRSV translation. In other words, if this story of God's gracious commitment to us is true, then this is how we will live. And my encouragement to you and to myself is to live as if it's all true. Live as if all the promises of God in Christ are completely 100% trustworthy and true. And if moments of doubt or despair arise, keep on plodding. Live as if it's true. Remember that God never gives up and receive the spring in your step. Look again at this little list of instructions with me. Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That's rooted in your prayer life, your inner spiritual disciplines. 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. That's super practical and needs almost no explanation. Give, share, be generous, be hospitable. 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. In other words, guard your tongue. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Don't succumb to gossip or slander. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. In other words, get involved in one another's lives. Have a one-to-one, -one. have a coffee, a tea, meet up in person, meet up on Zoom. Listen to one another's stories. Learn to take seriously other people's experiences, good and bad. And in each situation, imagine how you would feel if it were you. Share in sorrow, share also in joy. Carrying on, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Don't ever believe that the world revolves around you or that you're more important than other people. You are dust and to dust you will return. You are loved beyond imagining by our Heavenly Father. But you're also just another ordinary person muddling along. Don't be seduced by vanity and ego. Verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
So hold yourself to account. Don't get sucked into tit-for-tat cycles of revenge, either sort of directly or indirectly through your thoughts or what you say. You won't always have peaceable relations with everyone, but do your best to make sure that for your part, you have been kind and honourable in how you behave and relate to others. And then verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In these troubling times and when the world is so full of polarisation and division and enmity and conflict, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Love. Love. Love as the Father has loved you. It may seem hard, but you can do this. To quote Jurgen Klopp again, the world outside is saying it's not possible. And let's be honest, it's probably impossible. But because it's you, because it's you, we have a chance. Because it's you, because it's Christ in you. It's Christ in you. We have a chance. Never give up because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. We have a chance. Because God has promised never to leave us nor forsake us, we have a chance. Because Jesus has promised to be with us to the very end of the age, we have a chance. Keep going in faith. Never give up, because God will never give up on you. Amen.